Good evening. I'd like to call the September 15th, 2020 meeting of the Buncombe County Commission to order. Thank you all for being with us. Let's begin our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise and join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Before we begin our meeting this evening, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence to acknowledge the tragic death last week of Henderson County Deputy Ryan Hendricks. In the early morning hours of Thursday, September 10th, Deputy Hendricks and fellow officers from the Henderson County Sheriff's Department responded to a reported breaking and entering call from a concerned resident. After identifying and approaching the suspect in the break-in, Deputy Hendricks was fatally shot and killed by the suspect. Deputy Hendricks also served our nation as a United States Marine. Ryan Hendricks was 35 years old. He leaves behind two children, six and nine, and his fiance. Anyone interested in learning more about how they can help Deputy Hendricks' family can find information about this on the Henderson County Sheriff's Department Facebook page. We appreciate all the men and women who serve as first responders in our community and across Western North Carolina and the nation. Let's have a moment of silence for Deputy Ryan Hendricks. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, I would like to read the ethics reminder to the board. In accordance with the code of ethics adopted by the board, all county commissioners <clears throat> have a duty to obey all applicable laws regarding official actions to uphold the integrity and independence of the office, to avoid impropriety in the exercise of official duties, to faithfully perform the duties of the office, and to conduct the affairs of the governing board in an open and public manner. Is there any item on the agenda, the outcome of which will have a direct, substantial, and readily identifiable financial impact for any board member? Does any board member have a financial interest in any public contract coming before the board today? There being none, all board mem members have a duty and obligation to vote on any matters voted on by the board at this meeting. All right, we come to the consent agenda. Are there any questions about any items on the consent agenda? All right. Um, we made a decision at our briefing meeting this afternoon to go ahead and talk about one item, uh, which was per purely for informational discussion, no vote to be taken, which was the uh, parental leave policy. So um, would there, is there a motion to approve the agenda as follows, minus the parental leave policy, which we discussed at the briefing? So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And um, Ms. Pender, just for folks who might not have um, watched the, the pre-meeting, there will be a follow-up discussion and public hearing on the parental leave policy. And what was the day that you're uh, tentatively scheduling the next discussion or public hearing? The second meeting in October. The second meeting in October. Okay, we'll follow up on that item um, at that time. Commissioner, uh, it would also be on the briefing agenda on the October 6th. The first meeting in October, we'll have another briefing discussion to bring back the analysis that you ask us to do. And then on the second meeting, we'll have the public hearing. Okay, terrific. All right, it's um, 5.09. Um, are we ready for public comment, Mr. Joyner? Or are we not quite there yet?
Okay. We'll check back in at five at five fifteen or shortly thereafter to see if anyone's called in. Okay. Um, yeah, because that's what they do. We do have a. Uh, we don't have any um, other presentations this evening. Ms. Pender, um, maybe you can just jump around a little bit. Do you have anything to mention under county manager report? Yes, sir. Just quickly, that staff has started watching Hurricane Sally in case there's any local impact. We are working with the state emergency management and local municipalities. We are starting to pre-position our resources in case there's a call-up for the USAR team to help deploy to the coast or any place else that needs assistance. As a staff, we will begin working in the EOC tomorrow to start monitoring if there's going to be any local impacts, and we'll keep you updated in case there's, as the weather evolves, we'll keep you updated. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Um, the next item on the agenda is the public hearing on the Community Development Block Grant. Uh, do we know if we have anyone signed up to speak during that public hearing? We have not had anybody Okay. And that might take a little bit longer. If you want to go ahead and go to the old business lobs, that will be a quick item as All well. All right, let's do the old business. Uh, resolution approving the issuance of the 2020C limited bond obligations for county solar projects. We had the public hearing on this at the last meeting. Good evening, commissioners. Um, this is the approving resolution for the issuance of the 2020 limited obligation bonds. Uh, background again, the county intends to issue private placement bank financing for the lobs and uh, the approximate value, amount of 10.5 million. Uh, there'll be a 15 year maturity. We have selected Truist Bank to do the private placement. Uh, the interest rate on that is 1.99%, which is really good, right Al? <laughs> um, the breakout of the projects, uh, 2.4 million will be Buncombe County, 2.19 million will be Asheville City Schools, 4.5 million uh, for Buncombe City, Buncombe County Schools and 1.1 million for AB Tech. Uh, this resolution approves the financing of the projects. It also designates the chairman of the board, county manager and the finance directors of county's representatives to act on behalf of the county, sign all the appropriate documents and so forth. Do you have any questions on the resolution itself or no. the debt issuance? I don't see any, Don. Thank you for the um, additional information. Uh, commissioners? Is there a motion on this I, item? I so move. Second. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Keep up, Heather. I feel like we, we, we have some discussion about this issue on every agenda for yeah. some reason. So it's just, it's just us doing it again. You know, and I'm sure there'll be something else the next one, but yeah. uh, that's okay. I'm all for it. I just um, can't get enough of you guys. So. <laughs> this is such a great project. Let's just talk about it at every meeting. All right. Uh, we've got a motion, second. Any further questions or discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Don, thank you. That sounds like your team did a great job negotiating. True excellent, did. really That's excellent crazy. financing terms for this, for this project. It's so thank you for your good work. Thank you. No joke. Okay. <laughs> I'm just not seeing any other item. That's only going to take one or two minutes. So, um, Let's see. I tell you what. Um, da, 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 da. Let's go to the board appointments. If that's yeah. if that's okay yeah. with the board, just since we do have yeah, to wait for five fifteen to make sure no one uh, of our public we don't miss our public comment. We've got um, two appointments to HHS and one to the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council. So there's there's two openings on. Health and Human Services and two applicants. These are for specific positions yeah. uh, on that board. You have to have, we have to have a pharmacist right. and a psychologist. Is that correct, Commissioner Edwards? And both of those fit that background. So, um, Chairman, I will make a motion for um, Dr. Amy Linnell and Dr. Elizabeth Lima to be appointed to the HHS board. I'll second it. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And then on Juvenile Crime Prevention Council, we have one appointment, and there's one applicant, Kelsey Simmons, who works at Open Doors of Asheville. 
I move that we appoint Kelsey Simmons to the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council. A second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Well, commissioners, uh, are there any other uh, <laughs> thought, things on your mind that anybody <laughs> wants to share with us as we? <laughs> okay. Well, I tell you what. Let's proceed. If someone calls in, please tell them that we want to hear from them, and we'll take and we'll come back to them as soon as we're done with the next agenda item, which we don't think will take very long. Okay. All right. The next agenda item is um, under new business, uh, suspending rural general public fairs October one through June thirtieth. I'm sorry. Let's go back to the public hearing. Thank you. Uh, we have a public hearing on the Community Development Block Grant coronavirus, and uh, Rachel Nygaard will present this item. Thank you, Ms. Pinder. Good evening, Commissioners. Rachel Nygaard, Strategic Partnerships Director. Max is going to pull up a presentation, and when you see it on your screen, the front, the first slide will say CDBGCV. Gotcha. That stands for Community Development Block Grant coronavirus. Um, so we're here this evening um, to make a couple of asks of you. When we are complete with the presentation, we will be asking for the board to consider approving a citizen participation plan. That's a required part of uh, going after these funds. And we will also be asking the board to open that public hearing that you were mentioning related to the design process. Um, so. Community development block grants um, are federal funds. These coronavirus specific funds are authorized through the CARES Act, um, which is the federal COVID funding, which you've approved and amended the budget to receive other, other CARES Act funding to county government already. This particular funding comes through HUD, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, through the state's uh, Commerce Department, specifically read the Rural Economic Development Division. The reason Strategic Partnerships is in front of you this evening is that this funding can be used for a lot of different types of activities, and we have not yet determined what our application will look like, but we do have participation um, in the exploratory phase from our planning department, who focuses on housing, from Health and Human Services Department, from intergovernmental relations, and others. Um, so at this time, what I will do is turn the microphone over to Heather Holsey, who you may have not yet met. Um, Heather is a temporary grant-funded employee with the county. She's a, in the role of a business officer focusing on our coronavirus funds, and so she's been doing the research and leadership on the CDBG CV funding <laughs> process. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Good evening, Chair Newman, members of the board. I'm happy to be here this evening and um, provide some specifics on the CDBG CV funds that Rachel has introduced for you. Let's see if this. Excuse me. Yeah, it didn't. Max? <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> we'll go with that. All right, so there is roughly <laughs> $27.5 million that is currently available statewide to non-entitlement jurisdictions. For CDBG, entitlement versus non-entitlement jurisdiction determinations are based on population. So Buncombe County is a non-entitlement jurisdiction along with all the incorporated jurisdictions within Buncombe County with the exception of the city of Asheville. The city is considered an entitlement jurisdiction and receives CDBG allocations directly from HUD. Therefore, any CDBG CV award to the county would be uh, to the county would not be eligible for use within the city limits and any city entitlement funds are not eligible to be used outside of the city limits. 
Uh, the maximum award amount that the county could apply for is $900,000 and applications are considered on a first come first serve basis. Uh, applications are being accepted by the state as of September 1st. Next slide. Uh, the notice of, of funding laid out priorities uh, specific to the CDBG CV funding, which are listed here, and include support families and communities through telehealth support and other public services, protecting the most vulnerable and high risk populations, assisting small businesses with economic recovery, and addressing testing, tracing, and trends. Next slide. Uh, the general CDBG program typically has a variety of eligible activities. The notice of funding for CDBG CV listed three specific eligible activities, which are public services, public facilities, and economic development assistance. So we've listed out what some of those different uh, activities may look like um, for you here. I won't read through every single item unless you'd like me to there. Next slide. Additional CDBG CV requirements are that each activity must meet a national objective. The most common national objective uh, met with CDBG funds is serving low to moderate income households and individuals. The other national objectives are the elimination of slum and blight and an urgent community need. Uh, there are some specific ineligible activities that are listed in the notice of funding, such as loans to small businesses, um, assisting small businesses that are in bankruptcy or debt restructuring, and the purchase of local government vehicles. There is a 10% allowance for administrative costs of the grant. So, if, for example, if the county was awarded the maximum $900,000, $90,000 would be eligible for grant administration cost reimbursement. There is no requirement for matching funds. However, showing matching local funds or leveraging other funding sources can strengthen an application. And all CDBG awards are subject to federal overlays such as subrecipient <coughs> compliance, environmental reviews, equal opportunity, fair housing, et cetera. Next slide. Uh, so the proposed application schedule is as follows. Funding availability was announced in August and applications are currently being accepted by the state as of September 1st. Um, as Rachel mentioned, this is the first of two required public hearings. Uh, the purpose of this one being to gain public input on what activities should be applied for and the second being your consideration of a completed application for submittal to the state. And we anticipate bringing that to you at your October 20th meeting. Um, the state has indicated that award notifications could begin in November, December, if you are one of the first getting your applications in um, timely, with grant agreements in place January. So the longer it takes to get your application in, that would be pushed out further. Um, if awarded, the grant will be a 30-month grant period. Um, that typically starts once the grant agreement with the state is executed. Next slide. So that brings us to one of the required pieces, as Rachel mentioned, of a local CDBG program, as well as required for the submittal of this application, which is a CDBG-specific citizen participation plan. The plan requires board approval and is included in your agenda packet. The plan outlines mechanisms for public involvement in county CDBG grants from application through award and the entire grant period. The plan also describes how public information is distributed and maintained for public inspection. So I'm going to hand it back over to Rachel to walk you through the requested board actions. Next slide. So pretty straightforward at this stage, we know the application is open and we know what it can fund. So we have two steps that are required to get an approved CDBG uh, citizen participation plan. Your packet includes a, resolu a resolution authorizing that approval and then the plan document itself, which talks about how we engage and share information with the public. It's more than only through this public hearing that happens in these chambers. People may also contact and engage with our office with their input separately. Um, once that plan is in place, then we are asking that you hold the public hearing on project design in case there are any callers that want to provide input tonight. All right, so approve the resolution uh, 
for the public participation plan first and then hold a public hearing yes thank you so will we have a budget when we when we know how much money we've been awarded we'll have a budget ordinance associated with that will we vote on that ordinance at that time there would be a vote at the if October 20th is when we're able to come back with a complete application and we would be providing a full copy of the grant application um, in showing uh, what we're requesting and then when approval occurs that's when the budget amendment that's when the budget happen. ordinance would but, be. Um, okay. the October vote would authorize the manager to accept those funds when awarded right is there a resolution is there a motion to approve the resolution approving Buncombe County CDBG citizen participation plan? so moved second all in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed all right now we need to open a public hearing okay and just I'm sorry could you just briefly restate we're, we're reopening a public hearing to get input on the plan or on the Restate that again briefly, please. Yes, we're looking for public comment on what the public thinks that um, what activities should be applied for under Very the good. CDBGCV. All right, I will um, open the public hearing at 5.25 p.m. Uh, Mr. Joyner, have any members of the public requested a, an opportunity to comment on this during the hearing? Okay. Uh, I'll close the public hearing at 5.26 p.m. Chairman, just got a just a comment, okay. Um, so when we posted this for the public hearing, um, would the public have been privy to the explanation that we just received? That what we're asking them for input on. I just want to make sure that uh, that uh, I mean I'm I'm not going to stop the approval of this. I just want to make sure that the um, I'm going to support it, but I want to make sure that the public has the opportunity. To, to give the input that, that, that we believe they need, that we need. Thank you. The public would, would have seen the materials that were included in tonight's packet, including the PowerPoint slides that we just went through, cool. um, describing the funding and um, that we're seeking input. The notice that was published also described that we're looking for feedback specifically on what activities we should apply for. And what I will state uh, verbally for the record, uh, for anyone streaming the meeting tonight, people can also comment by contacting the Strategic Partnerships Office. Um, Heather's phone number is listed in the notice and our mailing address and email is also fine to reach out. Uh, our contact information is listed on the maybe website. Just, maybe just for the record, could you share the email address if people wish to submit written comments on the plan, what's the email address they should send them to? Yeah, sure, I'll give mine and we'll make sure it gets to the right place. So, Rachel Nygaard. Uh, my email address is first name dot last name, which is R A C H A E L dot N Y G A A R D at buncombecounty.org. My phone number is 828 250 6536. Um, and people can contact me through either of those methods. There's also a mailing address at 200 College Street, Asheville 28801. And what period of time would you ask them to get those comments to you? That is a great question. Anytime between um, now and October 20th, um, oh, wow. okay. the sooner the better in terms of uh, program okay. design. Okay, thanks. That's what I was looking for. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Mr. Right. Chairman. Yes, sir. So, so the October 20th public hearing, is that because of a certain time frame? I mean, I'm, I'm, these applications open September 1st on a first come, first serve basis. We're having a public hearing on October 20th to approve an application to and then they're going to award in November. Do we need to move this up any, or can we move it up any? Um, our county manager asked the same thing, how fast can we move this process? Because this is a federal grant application and it's um, complex and time consuming, this is the most assertive time frame that we feel like we can commit to. Um, but if we can get it on the agenda for October 6, we will certainly uh, push to do so. And that's, that's, that's a month and a half after the application opened on a first come first serve basis so I just yep that's a tricky time frame um, fortunately all of the different counties that we're talking with um, regionally and gathered across the state are in the same boat so we're all responding on the same time frame. okay well okay just want to increase our chances so. absolutely 
Is there anything else we need to do we, on this item tonight? No, sir. Um, Avril? Up eligible if we already voted on it. <laughs> we voted on the plan and we had the public hearing. Right. I think if there's anything specific that would Thanks. I was asking Max to pull the PowerPoint back up to the, ele the eligible activity slide. If there's any specific activities that the board want us to consider, if you can look through that and give us some guidance as well, that would be helpful. Yes. I mean, I think to that point, maybe um, I'd love to circle back to sort of the, uh, something that came up during the briefing, which was just what we understand about sort of the uh, maybe the acuity of sort of the secondary and tertiary impacts that people are experiencing um, and wh what we're hearing from community partners from impacted communities. And that, that piece f feels like, it, but I'm sure you all are already kind of immersed in that part of it. Um, that's what comes to mind for me. I, I can answer the, some of the ideas that we've been brainstorming so far are those types of topics. We know it needs in, at the individual and household level or um, at a crisis level. You may have seen um, an article about the uh, eviction prevention. That's an eligible activity. So we could do tenant-based rental assistance to try to keep people um, in their homes with this funding. Small business assistance is also a thing that um, is rising to the top as a major community need. So if there were some way to organize a small business assistance program with these funds, um, that, that could be a possibility. Um, broadband is a word that's, that appears on this page. So figuring out how to craft something that could meet the, t the structure of these funds and increase internet access might be something that could be funded. Those are examples that um, have been tossed around so far. And just going back to Commissioner Penland's kind of question about the timing, um, is, it, is it your sense that the sooner we submit an application, the greater likelihood that will be awarded? Yes. Okay. Well, $900,000 is a lot of money, but it's not yeah. that much money. So it seems like it's, we could probably figure out some ways to uh, invest those funds. I mean, if, we, if it was $5 million, I mean, there's with COVID response, there's no sh shortage of yeah, pressing needs so it seems like we need to just identify the highest priority or two or three and and make a decision and move in not not tonight but just as soon as as an organization that we we can i'm certainly supportive of that you know we talked about the homelessness issue at the last meeting and invested funding in it um you know i would personally say if we think that the challenges around homelessness are going to outstrip the resources that we put in there and other, that exist I mean to me that would be my number one priority I mean if people are becoming homeless because they've lost their job there's no more federal support um, and there's you know and I don't know all the details of the national policies around evictions and things like that but I would list that as a number one priority if you know if, if the other, if the resources that are already going to be there are going to be insufficient to um, address the need but um, I would probably put you know hunger at number two but again I know there's a lot of other programs that address this yeah, issue. so I don't know if the existing programs are sufficient to meet the needs that are going to be there this fall and winter or not that's what of course we look to y'all to help us understand but those would certainly be kind of the fundamental basic life necessities that I want to make sure we can get through this you know this economic crisis health crisis um, helping as many folks as possible with those essentials of life <clears throat> so if you've got a small if you've got us um if you got a small business and you know i think of a uh, of a couple and they're um trying to decide on whether or not to close their doors and and they could receive rent or support would they would that qualify because what that would do particularly COVID impacted or maybe even startups small I'm talking about small business because it'd have to be a small amount that would help you know could help possibly retain you know three or four families I mean we don't uh, we don't know would that you think that that would qualify under here so potentially we could build a small business program in a reopen and rehire structure grants to businesses are tricky 
Um, but through this fund, we would be able to provide funding to businesses that have employees who meet the low to moderate income thresholds um, and gain some funding for those businesses to be able to get those employees back to work. Okay, so let me let me add, just point of information. You know, we had recently we had uh, um, Noah from Mountain Biz Works. So Noah, right? Yeah, Matt. from Mountain Biz Works. I'm thinking of the applications that were applied for the Buncombe County Job Recovery Act that they didn't, they they probably, they only had a limited amount of money, so they probably weren't able to fund some of those. So that might be a place where you could go. They probably already got a list, and you, there might be some places there that, um, you know, are, would still qualify and, and uh, anyhow, just, just a thought. Yep. But I, my main question was wondering if, these smaller businesses would would qualify. So and I'm not diminishing the chairman's uh, you know points on that he made, but I think this is an additional one too. To if we included it, we would likely work with the uh, those CDFIs, which are the community development financial institutions like Mountain BizWorks, yeah. because they're already administering the Paycheck Protection Program, Small Absolutely. Business Administration loans. This could be another potential um, funding resource. Um, like the chairman said, we're looking at all the different funding sources and trying to match them with the needs for the best overall picture of how to access and deploy these COVID funds. Okay, so you'd be reaching out to them and you know people like Physical Legal for you know housing issues and that's right, right? Okay. Mr. Chairman, sir, one more. Yep, Rachel. Yes. Would sir. it would it put too much on you if we could move it up? Because you're so, and what I'm hearing is the sooner the better, our chances. So if we could do it uh, October sixth, is that would that put too much on? Um, we can go back and look and see if that's possible, and certainly do our best. I, do. I mean, because I, I think the sooner we get this done, the, the, our chances are out there, and it it can help. It can help. No matter how we help, we know it can help. Mm -hmm. So. Well, just let us know. I mean, if it's if it's if the opportunity is there, certainly let us know. We're happy to move as fast as the you know is uh, feasible. Okay. We'll check the red, the limits on time frame between those two public hearings. That's yeah. what I'm ho holding in my mind, meaning to check the regulations on that. But as fast as we can move, we'll aim to move. Okay. Understood. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone who's working on this. All right. Um, <clears throat> has anyone checked in for public general public comment? Right. That's fine. Yeah, they haven't called it yet. I think they're. Yeah. All right. Um, very good. <laughs> okay. Now we come to new business. And the first item is uh, suspending rural general public fairs October 1, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. And Matt Cable will help us with this item. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Um, thank you for this opportunity to bring forth this item related to suspension of fares, uh, particularly rural general public fares for the period of October 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021 and completing the fiscal year. Um, as has already been discussed uh, just before, before me, the CARES Act has really changed and modified the landscape of funding um, as has COVID-19 for our various programs and systems. Transportation um, is not an exception um, to that changing landscape. Um, as indicated in the request for board action, COVID-19 has modified some of our funding streams um, in the current fiscal year. At the federal level, additional funds have been made available that will be flowing to the county through uh, the NCDOT as well as the city of Asheville. Uh, so there is additional funding being made available. At the same time, we have seen a reduction in state grant funding. Uh, so the state recognizing those federal funds flowing through um, them as a, a recipient of federal funding, they have actually reduced our ROPE program. And the ROPE program funding 
um, which has been eliminated for fiscal year 21. We're hoping that returns in FY 2022. Uh, but that program is generally used to support fare-free transit opportunities for elderly and disabled individuals. It provides some employment transportation at no fare. And then also um, rural general public service. So those would be demand response trips from a home to a destination with a $3 fare. At Buncombe County, we have worked over the years to identify as many funding opportunities and streams to provide transit at no cost um, to our ridership. Uh, this was one of the streams through which we were able to do that uh, using that rope funding. So with its elimination um, by the state in the current fiscal year, we were reconsidering how we might be able to continue to provide that, that necessary and needed service uh, for those impacted citizens at no cost to them. Uh, part of that involved reaching out to the NCDOT and our partners uh, there to determine what within the regulations would be permissible. Um, there are a number of funding streams, as I've mentioned, that we utilize. Elderly and disabled individuals we use certain funding streams for, and the CARES Act guidance was fairly specific that we couldn't reallocate and use that money for those trips. However, we can reassign those trips to another type. So if we're providing that same kind of service to citizens that are not elderly and disabled, which we do, and we reassign them into a general category, then we can provide those trips using that particular funding stream. So as, as the board is fully aware, our, our funding streams are complex and how we build our grant funding to support transportation is complicated. Um, but the effort to eliminate the fares would allow those citizens who have been able to travel fare free in those categories to continue that travel as well as provide some relief for citizens who regularly utilize uh, the rural general public program from paying fares um, during the remainder of the fiscal year. I will point out that the FTA has provided specific guidance allowing for temporary uh, reduction in fares. Um, so that was very specific to guidance that they released associated with CARES Act funding. Um, and and our anticipation is that the CARES Act funding that has been made available can be used to both offset that loss in the ROPE funding in the current fiscal year as well as the anticipated lost revenues from what was originally budgeted. I'd be happy to answer questions that you may have. All right, I don't hear any questions. Commissioners, is there a motion to approve the recommendation? So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, thanks, Matt. Thank appreciate, you. appreciate this. All right, next up is a discussion of a resolution adopting le leadership in energy and environmental design standards. Um, this is a follow-up from a discussion we had about this policy two weeks ago. And Jeremiah Leroy, Leroy will help us out with this. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, as Chairman Newman just said, this is just a reiterating something we discussed at the, the last briefing um, on high performance building policy. Hey, it's working. Um, these first couple of slides, just a, a quick reminder of what we've discussed in the past. Uh, benefits of high performance building resolutions in terms of them just being a best practice to reduce cost and reduce energy. And for us, really, what we're looking at is, as you know, we're all, we're, we're going through a, a facilities assessment, so we want to put something in place that helps us sort of manage our growth going forward as well. We really want to have something in writing that sort of guides how we develop in the future. So in addition to, you know, conserving natural resources, we've got a strategic uh, goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And so as we build out, we want to be very thoughtful about how we do it. And of course, after a great deal of internal discussion back and forth, what we landed on was leadership in energy and environmental design, LEED certification, uh, and LEED is the most widely, widely used green uh, building rating system in the world, available for all building types. And so, you know, it's, it's a really common practice, I think, in most local governments to have policies <coughs> of this nature. So as we discussed before, that's kind of where we landed. And so with the resolution itself, what I brought to you last time was new construction greater than 10,000 square feet, uh, for major renovations, 50% or more of the aggregate area of the facility. And after getting some feedback from you and listening to that discussion, what we sort of changed and brought to you tonight was uh, a resolution that tried to take some, some of your suggestions into account. And that is 
a couple of really, really specific points was requiring lead points and, and building to lead standard, but not necessarily requiring the certification process. Certification process can be relatively expensive, and really what you're paying for is mostly commissioning services and a plaque. And so, you know, that was a discussion I think we had that, you know, that's, that's an added cost, but it doesn't necessarily add benefit to the performance of the building itself. So if we build to the proper standards, we'll see that building performance. Uh, solar ready design was specifically mentioned and so it's been specifically called out in the resolution itself. Uh, the net zero energy where feasible has also been added to the resolution, obviously considering we have a 100% renewable energy goal as well as carbon reduction goals. Net zero energy where feasible makes a lot of sense. And then of course, uh, I think Commissioner Belcher potentially uh, specifically called out wanting to, wanting to see these decisions, you know, how are they being made? looking at these life cycle cost analysis. And so we've uh, added as a part of the resolution to bring presentations to the board on these life cycle cost analysis as they're done. So as these decisions are being made, we would like to bring those to the board to present to the board so that everybody can sort of be on the same page and understanding why these decisions are being made, how they're being made. Obviously, when you're talking about green building, not every decision has a cost and a payback associated with it. Um, you get points in LEED certification for putting a facility near good public transportation, right? We know that's a value, but it's not something that has a payback. Uh, but those decisions that do need to be made, whether it's uh, renewable energy decisions, you know, things like solar, or ground source heat pumps, things of that nature, that can be an added cost. We'll look at those life cycle analysis costs and bring those to the board for, for review. So those were the specific items that we sort of heard in that discussion, added to the resolution and brought to you tonight. So very quick presentation, that's all the slides I got, but I am happy to answer any additional questions you have, concerns you have, and, and you know, anything you got for me. All right, Jeremiah, thanks so much. So I just got a quick comment. Uh, I wanna commend you and the, and the team on bringing back a resolution that uh, you know addresses the, uh, uh, the questions that we had. I would, you know, and I, just a thought: if you're if you're if you're not going to, we had talked about having our own hybrid program. So if you're not going to have uh, and and pay for like for it to say lead certified, so maybe it could be, you know, bunkum something. I mean, it could be to our own um, performance standard. You know, high performance building, what whatever it would be. Uh, but you're following the LEED certification other than it might not necessarily be placed in a cer certain place, but the building is going to be built to the specs that we know, you know, meet our, our goals of uh, carbon reduction and other things. So just a, just a thought, but sure. um, I'm happy to make a motion to, to approve it once we have other comments, but I'm happy to make a motion to approve it. Go ahead. So moved. Second. Further discussion? Um, I'll, I'll also say I think the, uh, it's great, I think it was a great discussion two weeks ago, yeah. and um, I think the, uh, the, the um, updates to the recommendations are really good, and thank you for thinking that, all that through, and, and the commission did input on that. I think it's a good policy, so I'm excited to see it move forward. So any other I mean, you know, comments? It sounds like a little thing to say that you're not going to, I mean, that just to have the plaque or to do that is going to cost, you know, extra money and then the decision not to do that. Maybe that's not a lot of money, but that's a, that's a big decision. I commend you on doing that. I think that's, I think that's a good direction. And as long as we're, you know, mm -hmm. as long as we're building the building to meet the requirements, <coughs> that's what matters. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. It is not. Yeah. <laughs> but he totally agreed with what I said. Absolutely. So. I heard you just fine. And, and <laughs> yeah, we, we care about the building performance more than we care about a plaque on the wall. And, Absolutely. And so I'm, yeah. I'm with you. The, um, but we're not saying we're not going to do it. We're just saying we'll look at it <laughs> for each project. Right. And um, I think there are, I think there, um, I think there are, I think there is value to it. I mean, part of it is, um, you know, it's bringing in a process to get a, someone outside the organization to look at it and professionally validate it right and it's it's nothing against the great team that we have in the county but um, i think there is value i mean this is a you know there is some expertise outside the organization too that that um, can be can be beneficial um 
and I, and, I, and I don't think this is the case with Buncombe County because I think we're doing really great stuff in this whole area. But there's a lot of people out there in the world who kind of talk about doing a lot of green stuff. And, yeah. and, 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 and it's, in, in some cases, it's a lot more talk than reality. So the value of the certification is that it really validates that this, this isn't just us saying it. We've gone through a process and we've had uh, folks who are experts in the field uh, validate it and make sure the building really will perform over time in the way that we want it to. So, but I think it's the right thing to do to have flexibility on it. So I think it's, it's uh, arrived at a good place. Any other comments? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you, Jeremiah. Thank you. Okay, next up is a budget amendment for non-congregate sheltering um, model, and Jennifer Barnett's going to help us out with this as well as several other budget amendments. Yes. Good evening, Chairman Newman and Commissioners. The first budget amendment is for the county's uh, grant projects fund. The county has received notification through the North Carolina Emergency Management that reimbursement funding in the amount of $430,000 is available to provide the non-congregate sheltering program. Uh, this is a collaborative effort between the state, counties, and local partners to secure hotel and motel rooms or other um, suitable shelter locations, as well as essential wraparound services for individuals with no other safe place to quarantine, isolate, or social distance due to COVID-19. This budget amendment um, is a request to establish uh, the funding for the expenditures related to the non-congregate sheltering model uh, to be reimbursed uh, by the North Carolina Emergency Management up to the $430,000. All right, is there a motion to approve this budget amendment? So, so moved. Moved. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, next up is a budget amendment. We've got ser several, uh, well, we've got this budget carry forward request. Yes. And um, Jennifer will help us out with this one. Two. So each fiscal year cycle, the budget office uh, brings forward to you a budget amendment for budget carry forwards. Um, what a budget carry forward is, is budgetary dollars that remained from the prior fiscal year that departments had um, engaged uh, for services. They had identified that as part of their original budget plan, or you would have heard that come before you during the fiscal year um, to request funding for certain projects. But due to unforeseen circumstances, the funding was not able to be expended because we weren't able to take delivery of the products. The services were not able to be finalized um, for whatever justification, um, these were not able to be paid out for the fiscal year. So you will hear that as a common theme across the next three um, budget amendment requests. The first one is related to the general fund Outlined in the request for board action um, are amounts totaling $2,691,016. Uh, there were many items that were requested. Um, the bulk of that um, dollar amount was $1 million uh, for the Inca Commerce Park that was unable to, um, to begin due to NCDOT policy restricting new contracts. And then there were approximately $900,000 of the economic incentives um, that the uh, contracted entities have not submitted the, um, the final reporting paperwork that would be required to pay out the incentives. Therefore, that is still a commitment for the county, and we would need to make those funds available um, once they're able to finalize that. And if there's any specific questions related to the items that are outlined for this request, Otherwise, this establishes the budget um, in the fiscal year 21 cycle for the total dollar amount. So I'll make a motion to approve. Second. So we motion second for the budget amendment for FY 2020 to FY 2021 budget carry forward request for the general fund. Sorry about that. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> All right, the next is the um, 
establishing capital project ordinance for broadband projects. Yes, and this one uh, additionally corresponds with the prior general fund budget amendment, but during the fiscal year 20 budget planning cycle, $133,000 of funding was established in the general fund in IT operating um, budget to add internet connectivity at the Buncombe County Sports Park and Owen Park. Uh, information technology staff continue to work with internet providers to explore opportunities for internet connectivity throughout the county um, to help those who do not currently have access to high-speed internet. Um, staff is recommending waiting until the result, um, I apologize, so a request for proposals will be issued this fall to inquire as to the network provider's interest and willingness in expanding their networks across the county, which will include expanding services to the parks. So this $133 included the parks, um, contract negotiations or negotiations with the providers throughout the fiscal year um, wasn't able to be accomplished, um, but the, the request is to wait to be specific for these parks, get a response back about you know, what the internet providers may be willing to do. Um, and we are recommending that these dollars be made available in the multi-year fund um, due to that. And so this is a request to transfer the funding to the capital projects fund. So this is a, a request to establish a capital project fund with this amount of money. And we may have an opportunity to come back with you, come back to you in the future um, with further information or a request. All right, thank you. Is there a motion? So moved. All in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, and then one more budget carry forward request for transportation, share forfeitures, and solid waste funds. Yes. Um, so for simplification purposes, um, these are other annual funds that have other, um, other requests for budget carry forwards. And I have outlined those specifically um, in the narrative. Do you want me to go over those specifically around what their requests are? Just very briefly, yes. Okay. Uh, so for the transportation fund, they have requested $81,784 of their fiscal year 20 budget be carried forward. Um, Buncombe County uses NCDOT IMD section 5311 grant funds to procure mountain mobility vehicles and associated equipment on an annual basis. COVID-19 pandemic resulted in delays in vehicle manufacturing, which postponed the delivery of the ordered vehicle beyond, beyond June 2020. Um, so we are requesting um, the budget be established in fiscal year 21. Uh, we anticipate grant funding still for $64,779 and a match for these purchases of $17,005 in local funds, which were already budgeted in fiscal year 20. So we would just be asking to carry the budget forward and that would be the use um, of the dollars for the purchase. Do we, need, do, we need, do we need separate votes for the transportation share forfeiture and solid waste? You can do them at one time. Okay. Uh, so for the sheriff's forfeiture fund, um, there has been a request that $40,812 of the fiscal year 20 budget be carried forward. Um, there was or an order placed for ballistic vests. Those ballistic vests are customized to the individual's um, fit. And the order was made and they were unable to be delivered to June 30th. So the request is to carry this money forward so that they can finalize the purchase up upon delivery. The third and last is the solid waste um, fund has requested $282,498 to be carried forward. Uh, they had engaged and started services um, for the um, purchase of the brake trailer uh, for staff, in addition to working on additional garage improvements for creating additional workspace on the west and south sides of the existing single bay garage. Um, with the inability to have completed those, the request is to carry that remainder of that budget forward into the new fiscal year for completion. And a reminder that none, none of these is, is new funding. Um, this is already pre-existing from the, from the prior fiscal year. All right, if there's no questions, is there a motion to approve all three or any of them individually? I so move. Second. Second. This is for all three? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, sir. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you very much for your Thank help. Thank you. Appreciate you. Uh, commissioners, I believe that completes all of our um, business for this evening. I just got a couple of announcements. Um, Chairman, before you do that, could I have a, a point of personal privilege just to give the uh, uh, the, the board some information that I know you'll appreciate, and Commissioner Presley, because we uh, work on that. I'd uh, talk to... Uh, DOT this week and looks like that even with, with the delays that the uh, where the bridge is and walk off way and Inca Heritage Trail that connects over to Santee looks like they're going to uh, let that in February of 2021 and uh, I know that you know the whole commission approved it and it was a lot of, a lot of work done I know everybody's worried about whether or not that was going to happen in light of COVID and it's actually you know going to connect those roads together in the schools and and so I was pretty excited about it, and I meant to share it in our in our briefing and forgot about it, and this kind of brought it to my memory, so I appreciate you letting me share that with the board. So, well, Thank you for doing so. There's um, That's great news, and um, we've all heard about a lot of the transportation projects being delayed around the state yeah. because of sales, the gas tax money not coming in because people aren't driving, and so it's good to hear that project's got a, a good schedule. It really Let's is. Move ahead. Okay. All right, um, and there's no need for a closed session for any purposes this evening. Um, so just a couple of announcements on October 6 at 3 p.m. the County Commissioners will hold their briefing meeting at 200 College Street room 326 in downtown Asheville and that same day October 6 5 p.m. the County Commissioners will hold their next regular meeting at 200 College Street room 326 in downtown Asheville is there a motion to adjourn so moved all in favor aye. all in favor please say aye, aye. all right we're adjourned thank you all